Yes, brothers and sisters, welcome to another episode of God's Glory and His Story. I'm your host, MC Enemy. It's spelled I-N-A-M-E because it's not about me. It's about the Word of God and His truth on this channel. Don't forget the prayer of Paul to the Ephesians. Read it. It will bless you with understanding and, and of his love and his word. Remember the Catholic Christ at 1234 a.m. and p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All about speaking with one voice. All right, I, I just wanted to get right into it today because I got some explosive scriptural proof that God added to us. His original people, he added to his original people. And I'm going to hit you right up front with some scripture. And I'm going to hit you towards the end with some scripture. And there's a lot of scripture in between. So you may want to get some place and get a pen and paper so you can write down the scriptures or you can play this video several times so you can see it or pause it, whatever you got to do. But this one I am excited to bring. And it took me some time to bring it. And I know it's going to be good. Because anytime I got something good, the devil tries to slow me down or put me off. But I'm not going to stop. Can't stop, won't stop. I had a problem with my car the other day that put pushed back my schedule. Um, but like I said, no worries. I'm still going to do it. All right, so today's question is, were we the additions to God's chosen people or the ones added to. So in other words, are we the original or are we the added people? So right off the bat, before I get into that scripture, I just want to explain a little something about God's power. And it's, I'm calling it the uh, concept of no break power transfers. And I'm showing you some airplanes there because I come from an airplane background. So I have some knowledge of, of aircraft and aircraft have several backup systems. And one of them is called is the electrical system. And of course, on board, there are many computers on board these aircrafts nowadays. Well, just like any other computer, it doesn't like its power to be interrupted. So what happens is you have a backup and the backup has to make sure that the backup source is at the same power level, the same frequency of the power it's about to replace. So that's the concept of no break power transfers. And I brought this up because that's the way God's power is. It cannot be diminished. You can't stop it. What he said in his word, his prophecy, is what's going to be, whether you cooperate or not. Remember, his will be done. All right, here's this first scripture I'm going to hit you with. And it's 2nd Edris, chapter 1, 
verse 24. Now it's Esdras. This is in the Apocrypha. This is the King James Version, 1611 King James Version of the Bible. So if you're reading just a regular King James Version, you're not going to see Esdras. Now, I want you to know Esdras is just the Greek form of the prophet Ezra. So we have Ezra in our normal 66 chapters of the Bible, but there's also additional writings from Ezra in the Apocrypha called Esdras. Got to wonder why they take them out, take these things out. Why they take these things out? This is the same person that's in the 66 books of the Bible that you're saying that these writings are not inspired by God. Come on. But anyway, I digress. And I put some time frames on these scriptures so you can kind of see where these things fall. So this is during the reign of King Cyrus, which is uh, 50, uh, 559 to 530 BC. And it is written here, what shall I do unto thee, O Jacob? Though Judah wouldn't not obey me, I will turn me to other nations and unto those nations, I will give my name that they may keep my statutes. So right there, he's proclaiming Judah. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel has already been taken, taken out. He's proclaiming to Judah because they are following the same path that now he's going to have to bring somebody against them. Basically, he's going to have to give somebody else his name. And we're going to see what that name is later on. And don't forget, later on, towards the end of this, there's going to be another scripture that's going to hit you right between the eyes. Can't wait to get to it. So my understanding of that verse is just what I said. Judah, since you won't obey me, I'm going to expand who I call Yehudi, or as we say nowadays, Jews. So second address now, chapter two, verse 17 and 18. And I think there's another one after this. And it reads, fear not, thou mother of the children, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord, for thy help will I send my servants, Esau and Jeremy, after whose counsel I have sanctified and prepared for thee 12 trees laden with divers fruits and as many mountains flowing with milk and honey and seven mighty mountains whereupon there grows roses and lilies whereby I will fill thy children with joy. Now, I don't know about you, but that was those scriptures were very hard to understand, so I'm going to try to break them down as best I can in this next um, slide. But before I move on, you see I got a note at the bottom. Esau, he said he's going to send his, his servants, Esau and Jeremy. But Esau went too far. And I'm not going to get into that, but read the first chapter, and it's the only chapter, of Obadiah. And that tells you what's going to happen with Esau. Just read it. All right, so what that scripture was saying, and I'm trying to put it in layman's terms, today's terms, it's saying, and, and please feel free to correct me in the comments or tell me I'm wrong. That's fine to start a conversation. But it's saying, don't worry, Israel. And he's talking about Israel as a whole. I still have chosen you, says the Lord. To help you, I will send my servants Esau to provoke you and Jeremiah, the prophet's words from 626 BC to lead you. So Jeremiah's already gone at this point. He's already lived and wrote what he had to write. And at this point, 
And when Ezra was writing, he's saying that he, he, he gave us Jeremiah's words to lead us. And I got it on the, on the side, a picture of carrots and sticks. Got the carrot in front of the horse to lead them. And the stick would be Esau that he's using the whip, the donkey or the mule. And unfortunately, we are the mules because we were stubborn people. A lot of symbolism right there. But let me read on. After being tested, I have set you apart and prepared a beautiful place for you, Israel. And now your 12 tribes have diverse fruits. So it's not just us anymore. It's going to have, it's still us, but it's us with those who are attached to us. Diverse fruits. Anybody who believes in the Son and proclaims him and is saved. And you will have all you need to be happy. So that's what that verse was trying to say, in my, in my opinion. <clears throat> Again, please feel free to go back and correct me. Hopefully that makes sense. So let's look at some history and then we'll move a little bit further, but some history here. So he mentioned Esau, right? So I went back and in 1 Kings 970 BC to 931 BC is this area we're talking about. 1 Kings chapter 11, I'm going to read verse 14 through 20 and then 23 through 25. It is written, New Living Translation. Then the Lord raised up Hadad, the Edomite, a member of Edom's royal family, to be Solomon's adversary. Years before, David had defeated Edom. Joab, his army commander, had stayed to bury some of the Israelite soldiers who had died in battle. While there, they killed every male in Edom. Joab and the army of Israel had stayed there for six months, killing them. But Hadad and a few of his father's royal officials escaped and headed for Egypt. Hadad was just a boy at the time. They set out from Midian, went to Paran, where others joined them. Then they traveled to Egypt and went to Pharaoh, who gave them a home, food, and some land, and raised him in Pharaoh's palace amongst Pharaoh's own sons. Pharaoh grew very fond of Hadad, and he gave him his wife's sister in marriage, the sister of Queen Tapinus. She bore him a son named Genubeth. Topanes raised him in Pharaoh's palace among Pharaoh's own sons. God also raised up Rezon, son of Eliada, as Solomon's adversary. Rezon had fled from his master, King Hadadezer of Zobah and had become the leader of a gang of rebels. After David conquered Hadadezer, Rezon and his men fled to Damascus, where he became king. Rezon was Israel's bitter adversary for the rest of Solomon's reign, and he made trouble, just as Hadad did. Rezon hated Israel intensely, and continue to reign in Aram. And I got a note at the bottom. It said Damascus, where he became king. Damascus is in Assyria that would later capture Israel, the northern kingdom, the Assyrian captivity. So could the Jeremy in the book of Ezra's be Jeroboam. 
Hmm, I don't think so, but let's check him out anyway, just for historical point. So again, we're in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 16, excuse me, 26 through 33, 32. New Living Translation. Another rebel leader was Jeroboam, son of Nebat, one of Solomon's own officials. He came from the town of Zerada in Ephraim, and his mother was Zeruah, a widow. This is the story behind his rebellion. Solomon was rebuilding the support, supporting terraces and repairing the walls of the city of his father, David. Jeroboam was a very capable young man. And when Solomon saw how industrious he was, he put him in charge of the labor force from the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, the descendants of Joseph. One day, as Jeroboam was leaving Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah from Shiloh met him along the way. Ahijah was wearing a new cloak. The two of them were alone in a field, and Ahijah took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into 12 pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, take 10 of these pieces, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon, and I will give 10 of the tribes to you. But I will leave him with one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. So that's why you have the 10 tribes in the north, and just two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin. Have you heard of the divine order of the gospel? I, I might sound like I'm going on a little tangent here, but of course I'm going someplace. So just bear with me. So 1611 King James Bible, Acts chapter 13, verses 46 through 49. It is written, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Now you got to remember, ain't no copying machines, ain't no printing presses, no Xerox. That's no small task to have the word published throughout a region. But that's what the word says. And Paul reaffirms this divine order in Romans. So New Living Translation, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It is written, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. So the divine order is Yahudi, which we call now Jews, and then to the Gentiles. That's how the word has to be uh, brought. Because that's how God gave it to us. He gave it to Yahudi first, or Israelites, and then it spread to the rest of the world. So the word of God, there's two primary Greek words that describe scripture, 
and are translated in the New Testament. First is logos, which refers principally to the total inspired word of God and to Jesus, who is the living logos. Notice it said the total inspired word of God. Like I said, the 1611 King James Bible has other chapters. And I don't know who man was to go through and decide that these words are not inspired. So that's the first Greek word. The next word is rima. And, and that's the spoken word. So the second primary Greek word describes scripture is rima, which refers to word uh, that is spoken and means an utterance. A rima is a verse or portion of scripture that the Holy Spirit brings to our attention with application in a current situation or need for direction. The Holy Spirit brings it to your attention with application. All right, so New Living Translation, Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 22. Meanwhile, the believers who had scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God but only to the Jews, only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turn to the Lord. When the church at Jerusalem heard what happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. So on the right of your screen, you can see it says Syrian Antioch. If you look down below that, you will see Phoenicia, and if you look right there where the gray line is going through, it's a little island, there's Cyprus. And if you follow the line all the way to the left of the screen, you can see Cyrene is in North Africa in the area of Libya. So this is just to give, put these things, places in context. This is all around the Mediterranean Sea. You can see Egypt at the bottom dead center. You can see Jerusalem off to the right towards the bottom. It has a cross there, red cross there is Jerusalem. So this is the area that, that they were talking about where they were converting people into Christians. This is the area that the believers had spread out to after Stephen's death. They stoned Stephen to death. They were being persecuted. So many of them left the area. Just as a side note, since I was talking about North Africa, there was a king of Judah named Amaziah. You can look at 2 Kings, you can look at 2 Chronicles, you can look in the book of Amos, and you will see this King Amaziah mentioned. And it came to my mind, because we had studied these people before, and, and we tied them together to us through G DNA, that there's a group called the Berbers. And the Berbers were also called Amazi. And you can see how it's spelled. And Amazi means free people. 
Amaziah means strengthened by God or God is mighty. But you can see the similarity in those the name. These names are not just pulled out of thin air. These names are, are usually derived from someone, some historical figure. And when they get to a particular land, they give that land their name, the name of their ancestor. Just a side note. All right, so 1611 King James Bible, Acts chapter 13, verse 1 through 3. This is about to get good, so pay attention. It is written, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manain, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, which we know as Paul, So if you remember, we just read Acts chapter 11, and I put it here again, verse 20. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord. So Simeon and Lucius are of Cyrene. Now, what I want to bring to your attention is the name Simeon that was called Niger. In white, you can see Strong's Concordance number 3526, Niger, and you see how they pronounce it the way that we don't like it to be said, is Latin for black. And Simeon was called Niger. And they also have Niger as a Christian. Now they say that, you know, uh, Niger was his surname, but I'm going to get there in a minute, what, what I think. But like I said, so believers in the Bible are Yehudi, also known as nowadays as Jews. And this one here, Simeon, was called Niger. He was called Black. What up, Black? So you got Niger, a, a country in Africa. You got Nigeria, a country in Africa, named after Yahudi. Man, I'm hope, I hope this is sinking in. I hope this is sinking in. I am excited. I was excited when I came across these scriptures. So it, let's just say you got two friends with the same name. How are you going to distinguish who you're talking to? You got to have a distinguishing feature to separate and identify which one you're speaking to. So Simeon versus Simon Peter. Remember, Peter in the Bible was also named Simon. It's Simon Peter. Jesus gave him that name, Petros, Peter. Now, maybe in the Hebrew or Greek tongue, those two names are said the same. I don't know. But they, the Bible took a time to separate Simeon from Peter. Because I'm going to show you in a minute in Scripture, they use the word Simeon to describe Peter later on. So they were using that name interchangeably. So obviously, the Simeon that they call Niger or they call Black was darker than Simon Peter. 
Now, both, both are swarthy, dark skin, but Simeon was notably darker than Peter. And if you think about it to this day, we think about Nigerians, they do have a darker hue than others of us who are swarthy. So let's look at this next scripture. 1611 King James Bible, Acts 15, verse 14 through 18. And it, it, it is written, Simeon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophet as it is written, after this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build up again the ruins thereof. And I will set it up. And before I read on, Simeon here is actually meaning Simon Peter. If you go and read that chapter and get it in context, you will see that they are talking about Peter here. Not Simeon Black, they're talking about Simon Peter, Peter. Let's read on. Verse 17, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Upon whom my name is called. We've been reading that quite a bit. So here it is. I'm about to hit you in between the eyes. 1611 King James Bible. Amos chapter 9. Verses 7 through 12. This time period is 783 to 742 BC. And he's speaking through the prophet Amos. God is speaking through the prophet Amos, talking to the Israelites. Are ye not as children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? Saith the Lord. Have I not brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaftor and the Syrians from Kerr? Behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon this sinful kingdom and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth. Saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among the nations like corn is sifted in a seed. Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake us nor prevent us. In that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. So all this talk about third temple, building the third temple. God said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to build it as in the days of old. Reading on, verse 12, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doeth this. That phrase, there it is again, which are called by my name. In this case, now I know God has many names, so don't call me or email me telling me God has many names. I know that. But in this case, 
his core root name is Yah, which means I am. And his people are Yahudi. Yahu being singular. And in Greek, that's I E W E I and two U's, U, because they did not have a corresponding Y. So he's saying people who call themselves Yahudi from Edom or from other heathens that call themselves Yahudi. So it says that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the heathen which are called by my name. Mm. Now note, God was speaking to Israel, the northern, the northern kingdom, when he proclaimed that through Amos. And just 10 years later, approximately 10 years later, Israel was captured by the Assyrians. But here it is. Did you catch what he said? God asked, what's the difference between you and the Ethiopians? And when he told them, he didn't mention their skin color. Did you catch that? Go back and read it in the original version or the, the oldest version because other versions have whitewashed or changed that verse also. But read it in the 1611 King James Bible. Oh my goodness. The, are you not as the Ethiopians to me? He's basically saying, what's the difference between you and the Ethiopian? You sinful nation. There's no difference between you two, except for the fact that I brought you out of Egypt. It's not their skin color. What color are Ethiopians? There it is. Oh my goodness. I've been waiting to get this out for the longest. Oh, I hope you guys are sitting there bouncing up and down going, oh my goodness, just like I was. Please go back and read it. Look at it for yourself. Come to your own determination. Do not trust my interpretation. Mm -mm -mm. Woo. So I'm happy to follow the carrot of Jeremiah. Remember the carrots and the stick? And he talked about Jeremy and, and Esau, but we're just going to follow the carrot. We don't need the stick. And I'm going to end where I, basically where I started in the book of Esdras. So New Living Translation, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 1. It is written, In that day, saith the Lord, we all know what that day is, right? I will be the God of all the families of Israel and they will be my people. Thank you, Lord. King James Version, 1611 King James Version, Second Edris. Chapter six. Verse number nine. It reads, for Esau is the end of the world and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. That's a powerful statement there. You can let it digest. But what it means to me, you know, who's running this world now? Edomites. 
and they are going to destroy this world. But when he says Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth, he's talking about the seed or the descendant of the house of Jacob, the one who holds that scepter, our Lord and Savior, when he comes back. Whew. I, I hope I did it justice, brothers and sisters. I, I, I tried. It, it took a lot to put this together. But, and like I said, the devil was trying to deter me, but I was having none of it. I got it done. I got through it. And I hope it has blessed you. If it's blessed you, please like it and share it with others. Remember, you can catch me on Hebrew Connect TV. And if you haven't done so thus far, please consider subscribing and clicking that bell notification. So next time a video is released, you will be notified. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father, for getting me through this. And hopefully in enlightening your brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters, and your people. Here's my email address, guys, if you wanted to email me, and if you want to drop a line in the comments about what you think about this episode or any other episode, feel free to drop a line in the comments. We can start a dialogue. I'll be happy to hear from you guys because I love you guys and I appreciate you guys. Thank you for watching. And as always, worship the Father, praise the Son, and accept the Holy Spirit. Y'all be blessed. Until next time, peace.